and welcome to Reading Aloud, and today I'm really on home ground. Picture books and poetry. Thomas Gray said poetry is thoughts that breathe, words that burn. And we'll be examining an anthology that one reviewer said could save lives. Also in this week's show, Baby Brains, on stage with author Simon James. His caricature of a clever kid comes to life in the classroom, and it's Poets' Day in Birmingham. On, I man. wandered lonely as a cloud. No, I'm going to something. Oh, yeah, oh, yon, no, and some... hill. First, a book I love and wish that I'd written. It's Baby Brains. It's the story of an exceptionally talented infant and his pushy parents, written and illustrated by Simon James. It's won him the Red House Children's Book Award, the only publishing prize judged entirely by kids. We caught up with Simon at the Hay Festival. Please give a rousing morning welcome to Simon James. Simon isn't one of those shy, reticent authors. He's a tent performer, a bit of a ham, who's more than happy to show how he created the smartest baby in the world. When I draw babies, I like to think of potatoes. <laughs> it helps, honestly. I was quite interested in the idea of ha hot housing children. We're always preparing children for uh, what's next rather than just simply being here. And I felt that it was very interesting that some parents actually want to prepare their children even when they're in the womb by playing tapes of music or soothing them or something. And I wonder what it would be like to go that little bit further and really develop this child's ability. Then you would be born with this incredibly intelligent baby. Does he look very clever though? No, he doesn't look very clever yet, does he? What could I have around him that would make him look really clever? Ten P from your mum, if you can tell me. Computer. Computer. That's fantastic. I think humour is a very important tool in, in storytelling. Uh, one of the things that humour does, which I find quite amazing, is that you can only laugh now. It brings you totally to the present. You can't prepare for laughter. Um, you can't live in anticipation of it, it's there when it happens. So as a device in storytelling and to use in books, it's a wonderful way of bringing uh, the immediacy of what is happening within the words right now. There's a very clever baby. Nice big mobile phone, there we go. In the months before Baby Brains was born, Mrs Brains was very busy. She read out loud every night to the baby inside her tummy. She played music and foreign languages on headphones to her baby during the day. Mr and Mrs Brains wanted to make sure their baby was going to be very clever. And when they brought him home from hospital, Mrs Brains laid him down in the brand new cot. Sleep tight, baby Brains, she whispered. Now the next morning, Mrs Brains was on her way to get breakfast when she heard some strange noises in the living room. She opened the door and she gasped because there, inside the living room, on the sofa, was the baby, reading the morning paper. By the afternoon, Baby Brains was helping mend the car. We the children at Ronxwood Infant School in Worcester are thoroughly enjoying the exploits of Baby Brains. Their teacher, Lisa Hope, has devised a whole range of activities around the story. Now, you chose to read the story out loud. This wasn't yeah. a, a book that you kind of left lying around for oh, the children, no. 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 No, so why is that? Why read a story out loud? I think, I mean, particularly with infant children who I work with, there's still something quite magical about reading a story to, to a whole class. You literally have them in the palm of your hand, anticipating and waiting for the next bit of the story. That evening, Baby Brain spoke his first words. I'd like to go to school tomorrow. Right. The children leave the reading circle to continue the story in their own classroom, where one little boy is playing the role of Baby Brains, arriving for his first day at school, aged just two weeks. Would you like to go and take a seat, Baby Brains? We stopped at the bit where he goes into school and we did some freeze framing and thought tapping. The children literally recreate one of the scenes from the book, one of the illustrations, so they're physically in the characters' positions. So we had the image of the illustration from the book upon the smart board so we could see where the characters would be. And then we froze them. We had freezing dust that froze the children. Can you look at what your character is doing and freeze in that position? Ready? One, two... Three, freeze. 
and we got the children to talk to each other, to pick a character from the scene and to imagine what they were saying. So it gave everybody time to think about what it is they would be thinking if, if they were them. By the time I count to three, share your thoughts with me, me, me. One, two, three. I'll be a teacher. I'm going to be the teacher. We did it as a whole class, first of all, and then they went into small groups. By the time I count to three, share your thoughts with me. And then from that came the writing, and because we'd done the drama and the improvisation first, then you got much more imaginative writing, so we had the scene from the book again yes. with thought bubbles and had one on my smart board that we did together. And, um, and then they had individual ones where they actually went away and wrote in the thought bubbles what the different characters were thinking. Um, and at first I thought they were just going to copy what we'd done the drama, but actually it stimulated much more imaginative responses. It's given them the confidence to be able to, if I asked them to, write their own version of Baby Brains. It's encouraging them to use their own ideas and, you know, that's OK to use their own ideas. He's too smart for this class. He is too... Smart. I think with young children, they physically got to experience what it is like. You know, as near as you can experience what it's like to be baby brains or, you know, we've got to make that very real for them. Baby brains, mum and dad find out he's um, so clever bec because he mends the car and reads the newspaper. He was the most cleverest baby in the world. I mean, in a way, the book does say something quite hard about parents, doesn't it? I mean, when you, when you look at it, in a way that, that the story is saying, you know, some parents, they do want their children to overachieve, and it's a sort of very gentle mickey-take, isn't it? Oh, yes, I mean, it's got a mixed message. I don't know whether the, the children that I teach kind of got that, you know, were, were reading it on that level, but, I mean, it's the sort of book you could use with further up a primary school um, to deal with those kind of issues, yes. Yes, or with adults even, couldn't Absolutely. you? Absolutely, parenting yeah. classes. <laughs> What do people do at times of great stress when the world feels unreal, inhuman and hollow? Well, if the sales of this book, Staying Alive, are anything to go by, they turn to poetry. It's got old favourites like W.H. Auden's Stop the Clocks from Four Weddings and a Funeral and 500 more exceptional poems, and we'll be discussing its merits in a moment. But do people really turn to poetry when the going gets tough? Let's find out. I like cheering myself up with it once in a while. It is a good outlet for stress. I don't really read a lot of poetry, I just one poet. Who's that? And Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou? Yeah. And why, why do you like her? Um, she talks a lot of the truth. She talks from the heart. People usually get poetry through music, don't they? You know, like Bob Dylan and yes. things, things like that. I mean, that, that, I mean, it's like I suppose to ordinary people, but that's poetry, isn't it? Yeah. I probably wouldn't read it. I, I like to listen to it. Yeah. To get the emotion, to get what the guys are saying. Well, the obvious one. Go on, I wondered lonely as a cloud. No. But does something. Oh, uh, you no, some... hill. I Relying. wandered lonely as a cloud, or something like that. You yes. Know, like, you know, just things that spring to Actually, that's actually an improvement. <laughs> I wandered lonely as a cloud, or something like that. That's yeah. quite a good line. <laughs> Can you remember any that you liked? No, I didn't like any really. You did not, not a single one? No, not really. Hunting of the Snark. It has to be every time the Hunting of the Snark. I do like some of the serious stuff as well. Yeah. Spike Milligan's done some beautiful stuff. Helen Steiner, she's good. Is she? I don't yes. know her. Helen Steiner. She's, she does all the quotes for, like, cards and bereavements and stuff oh, like right. that. She's right. great. Uh, There's a worm outside and he's wriggling on his belly. Why doesn't he come inside and... See what's on the telly. <laughs> That's Spike. That's Spike, yeah. Sometimes I feel I just can't need the things I need in time, and time comes again and again, and it's a fire in which we all burn and turn and think that sometimes I just need to stop and think. Hmm, <laughs> impressive. But does poetry please our panel? We've all been reading the best-selling anthology, Staying Alive. Jane, are you, a, are you a poetry reader? Yeah, I do. I read poetry every day. I just I keep really? it in the loo by my bed on my desk. I yeah. just like poems. If you're stuck, there's a poem. If, you, if you're having a good time, there's a poem. If you're feeling really miserable, there's a poem. And this book is just great for that. Yes, yeah, so we've got 12 sections there, haven't we, Mike? Let's just run through one or two of those. We've got My People, War and Peace, In and Out of Love. Uh, slightly unexpectedly, perhaps. Me, the Earth, the Universe. You can't get more ambitious than that, can you? You can't, no. Um, and then finally, The Art of Poetry. Now, did this grab you? Uh, are you a reader of poetry, usually? 
Not regularly, not for a long while. Uh, but uh, I must say that I thoroughly enjoyed going through it. You can dip into, uh, dip into it. There are 500 poems uh, in here, many of which I hadn't come across before. And um, I found myself staying with the book much longer than I expected to and turned up some real gems that I totally enjoyed. Like? Um, some of the Eastern European poets in particular I liked. Uh, there's one uh, called Look in Sarajevo. I'll just quote you a couple of lines from it. Um, you go stand in a bread line and end up in an emergency room with your leg amputated. That was one guy's view of Sarajevo in 1992, which I don't think anybody could have put, put that better. I yeah. remember things happening like that at the time. But you never think about the mundanity of standing in a bread queue and then losing mm. your leg ten minutes afterwards. Samira, so, it's a very ambitious anthology. I mean, it is claiming a lot for itself. You know, if we say real poems for unreal times, I think Neil Astley wanted this somehow or other to really stake out what poetry can do in a difficult time. And the need for poetry is more important now than, than it ever was because I think we have to move beyond the functional use of language. And, yeah, I do think that poetry can elevate your soul or, or confirm your experiences. And how ideas. does it do that? If we say... I mean, elevate your soul is fine. How can it do that? I mean, it is just words on the page. I mean, you know, the back of a cereal packet is words on the page. So how can poetry do that? Well, it's just the way that language is put together and meaning is formed through language. And so, again, it's not like a, the words on the back of a cereal packet because it's not so functional. But it's the fact that a poet chooses the very best words that he or she can and puts them together. There's some absolutely beautiful language in here. And you flick through it, you stop occasionally and just think, yeah, that just, that just rings a bell with me because mm -hmm. I've felt exactly the same way. One of the things that poetry is very good at is the moment, isn't it? That whereas extended prose takes us into all the feelings mm -hmm. of everybody quite often or deeper and deeper into one person maybe, poetry is very good at just that little moment and the significance mm. of the moment. Any surprises there for you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a raunchy book. I really like the love section. I mean, I just like that sort of love poetry, which is really physical and quite sexy, really, and I, I really enjoyed all those. I think there's some great ones in here. From a teaching point of view, I, I'd, I'd go along with Jane. There are one or two very raunchy poems in here that you'd have to be very careful that you'd read through thoroughly. Come before. on, let's not beat about the bush, as it were. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's find out what you're talking about. Well, I, I really like the one, two, page 254, Love Beginnings. 254, we'll all look to this mm -hmm. now. This is a little bit of fun here. That just to watch them is to feel again that hitching in the groin, that filling of the heart. The old sore heart, the battered, foundered, faithful heart, snorting again, stamping in its stall. Love Beginnings from C.K. Williams, mm. that one. You yeah. quite like that, yeah, bit of I old like that. love there. Yeah, I just, yes. I like that. Now, is this a book that um, is going to find its way, if you like, through the gaps in your life? Will it be in your toilet? Will it be with you on a bus? I think um, that's its intention. It's quite a tall order for it this It is book, quite a tall order, yeah. But yeah. having said that, I will return to it, most definitely. <laughs> You don't have to, it's not homework, <laughs> you don't you? OK. Mike? I think it's done the job for me. Uh, it's, it, it's certainly got me back into reading, uh, reading, reading poetry myself, which is difficult to do because you're so constrained as a teacher in the, the poetry that you're... basically, you're, you're allowed to teach in schools. Yeah. Jane? I read it. I, I bought it, did it on holiday, and it was a great holiday book because, uh, you know, you, it kept me going for a whole fortnight. Well, that's all for now. Just time for a little poem that I tell myself when times are tough. It's by Lord Byron. He imagined an epitaph on the gravestone of the Prime Minister he hated. Posterity will ne'er survey a nobler grave than this. Here lie the bones of Castlereagh. Stop, traveller, and piss. Bye now. <laughs>